everybody, it's a Petapixel podcast party, and I am here with my good friend, Chris Nichols. Say hi, Chris. We're back. We're back after a week hiatus. And who's that beside him? Oh, man, it's my other good friend, Jaron Schneider, back from adventures in the Far East. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, were, we were back from adventures in the... Old you can't school say, west. Un, undisclosed. <laughs> undisclosed locations going on our own adventures. We cannot talk about this week. So we're, it's, it's going to be a very Jaren centric issue. But, oh boy. you know, with this podcast, it might be some people's first episode. And I just really want them to get a sense of who we are if they haven't oh, already watched the game. show or encountered Jaren. So, guys, we did the worst podcast ever. Theoretically, we are sentenced federally. To death, what is your last meal? Oh. Oh, I don't know. Um, dang it. I, I wish I had some heads up. I have no idea. Come back to me. I don't know. Okay. Mine would be a some some sort of take on sushi, although I don't think that I would want it to be a traditional just like sushi. My mouth is watering right. just thinking about eating sushi. Um, while I was in Japan... I had a bowl of, of like tuna cuts on seasoned rice. And that was probably one of my favorite things I've ever eaten. So maybe that something like that, that sounds like really good sit there and enjoy it. As I ponder how a podcast, regardless of quality ended up in my death sentence. Yeah. 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 I mean, it it is an unfortunate law and a weird one for sure. Uh, You know, I was waffling. I was like, am I going to do like a roasted lamb or am I going to do do love lamb? I love lamb. (laughs) Guys, I am going to hit the middle ground. I'm having lamb vindaloo, just like the hottest okay. pasta. I'm like, I want right. to experience every sensation before I stop. Okay. So, yeah, right. I'm going to go with the hottest lamb vindaloo, just mouth on fire, tears. And then I'm like, make it end, make it end. And and then the whole thing will be much less emotionally so traumatizing your last well. That's my strategy. Choice. Your last meal choice is going to be the same thing that like every British football fan wants after they're you know drunk at a game that's that's your last meal is that what i guess want? The, oh I yeah oh that. yeah beef and lamb vindaloo after after the footy absolutely after oh, yeah. the footy yeah yeah yeah. i, I do want to say at a recent event we were seated with the brits and the aussies so we have uh, a huge amount of insight <laughs> into their culture and interests now <laughs> that we can bring to the pod jaron i, I right. spent a significant amount of time with richard butler from dp review does that does that in, does that help he's, i mean he's, he's He's basically he's an American now. British. Yes, he's quite. Yeah, we, we can text him and see if Chris's <laughs> statement is correct. So, all right, Chris, you've had enough time to think. You have okay. to give it. Yes, I appreciate you giving me the time. So, I would say I would go with like a comfort food. You know, something that will like just relax me. Natto. Some. So natto is disgusting. You're the only person, you and my mom are the only people on the planet that would eat what smells the same that going the into your sentence. body as it does coming out. It smells like paint thinner. Anyway, what's, what, what is an actual then comfort you poop food paint you thinner. Like? Um, I think it's a comfort food. Anyways, I'd, oh, I, I would go with uh, chicken pot pie. Classic, uh, you know, hearty chicken pot pie. Just, you know, comfort food. Relax. You know, and then hopefully die while still eating it. That would be nice. Okay. Poisoned chicken pot pie. Okay. <laughs> I think this was a great intro. We all did an awesome job, and uh, we should watch the opening cartoon now. Your intros. Thanks to OM System for sponsoring this episode of the Petapixel Podcast. OM System recently unveiled its latest flagship camera, the OM1 Mark II, on January 30th, building upon the legacy of the original OM1. With double the buffer size and impressive high-speed sequential shooting capabilities, up to 50 frames per second with continuous autofocus, the new camera offers enhanced AF performance, accuracy, and reliability. 
Anticipated to begin shipping any day now, insider information from OM System reveals that they extended their pre-order promotion. Originally expected to conclude on February 26, it is now extended until the end of March. Pre-order your OM1 Mark II body or kit by March 31st and enjoy an additional complimentary BLX1 battery. Bundle your purchase with select lenses to save up to $300. Visit explore.omsystem.com slash petapixel for more details. Thanks, 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 OM. Thanks again to OM System for sponsoring the Petapixel podcast. We really appreciate mm. it. We're going to talk a little bit more about OM actually today. In the uh, so for those who are used to the way we typically do our our podcast, we'll do like a couple news stories and then we'll have a main segment and then we'll move on. Uh, there was so much that happened in the last <laughs> week that we have no time for a main segment. The main segment is the news. Let's dive in. We're going to get through all of it. So that when I mentioned we'll talk about OM more to this uh, this episode, that's because there's some OM stuff in here as well. But let's. I think everyone dropped hot news. Yeah. Right. It, is there anyone who didn't? Hot New, I mean, uh, hot, news. Canon, hot scoops. Canon and Nikon were both kind of quiet. Uh, I don't think they had anything to t- say at CP+. This is what this is all about, by the way, for anyone okay. curious why this past week was so busy. Uh, there's a Japanese trade show called CP+. It takes place in Yokohama, Japan. Uh, it's huge. It is, it is the biggest remaining global trade show for mm-hmm. photography, and it is not huge. It is very <laughs> small. <laughs> Uh, no, everybody <laughs> says it's huge. I walked huge. I walked uh, the entire trade show in, I don't know, less than six minutes. You could do a whole full circle. Oh, wow. It's wow. very small. Uh, it, but, you know, the, the the big players, they all have the big booths. Uh, like yeah. Sony, Sony's booth was gigantic. I think that's the largest one I've ever seen from them. Wow. Uh, Canon's was really big. Nikon's was really big. But uh, it was the Photokina days where Fuji's you would have really to like big. actually sleep in a display. <laughs> Overnight. You'd have to be fit to do photo yes. kino, oh, where dude. now you can just kind of like shuffle, it sounds yeah. like. I do want to say like big ups to CP Plus because we had our best day on YouTube since joining Petapixel was um, first day of that tro. So yay, so CP Plus. Well, yeah. let's first, before that, I cannot let us go any further in this conversation without getting Jordan to talk about the Canon 24 to 105 f 2.8 because the listeners are very upset that you did oh, no. not get on camera and talk about this yeah, lens Jordan. for videography because it's a videographer's lens really oh but you made okay. Chris talk about it they want to hear Jordan's words out of Jordan's mouth so go okay so first of all they'll be the same um, words <laughs> So, yeah, Chris and I do actually discuss things before (laughs) he doesn't just like show up and I'm like, go like uh, there is a back and forth with both of us. And I did actually shoot some video with this, took it out to a a, a BMX competition, um, like a big air show. And uh, it was great. The reason I didn't go too far into it is, first of all, we did not have access to the servo mechanism, um, which is a big part of what makes this you know, such an enticing option for videographers. Um, but outside of that, um, you know, Chris can talk, speak to the breathing side of things. Um, I do find it absolutely baffling that the Iris ring only works for video shooters. Isn't that weird? I, I, it is yeah. very odd. Like just the, the disconnect of looking down at your lens and it's like at two, eight and you look at your camera body and you're shooting at F 16 is very odd. Um, <laughs> There has to be a but, way for them to fix that, the like, firmware update it to, to let I, that happen. Yeah, I mean, but the aperture, you can't have click stops, which, I mean, I don't think many photographers would care that much, but it's it's obviously purpose-built from the beginning. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, and it is truly a hybrid lens, but doesn't have some of the stuff that we might expect with, like, a cinema lens. Like, it is electronically par focal, which looks kind of odd. If you do like a snap yeah. zoom, you'll see the focus drift because it does breathe a little bit too. You'll see the edges of the frame move a little as it compensates for that. Uh, we've seen similar things on like the, did you ever see the giant Sony 28 to 135, Jaron, that was kitted with like the FS 700 and stuff like that. Okay. Very similar kind of look to it there. Uh, but it was an excellent video lens, uh, like shooting that kind of stuff where we've got 
subjects moving very quickly and you know erratically towards the camera the autofocus uh, on the lens did a great job keeping up the uh, actually the r5 was more the one that was struggling uh to keep up when someone jumped right into the frame had a few issues but the lens itself does perform wonderfully as a video lens we just didn't go too far down that in our full review because we didn't have access to the most important aspect that makes it such a good right. video lens which is that servo mechanism um but uh yeah that's my thoughts on it it's a great video lens okay well we did it you did you did it there was no we in there it was all you <laughs> uh all right well let's let's now move on back to the cp plus conversation and then the fact that it was a really big week for us on youtube and the main reason for that would be fujifilm and the x106 which i have yep. right here <gasps> I want it. Give me. You had it for a <laughs> yeah, day. Didn't have it. I, yeah, I, I, it was not long I enough. I hand delivered this to you, and then I hand delivered it back to myself. And then you took it away <laughs> yeah, like a monster. Right. So uh, <laughs> let's let's recap here. Uh, the Fujifilm X one hundred six was announced at I think it was a two hundred dollar price premium over the two, uh, the X one hundred five. Uh, but that was no uh, inhibition on people's interest. It is probably our most viewed video in the first 24 hours that we've done. How does it compare to like videos you've done in the past? Well, well this is easily one of the biggest launch yeah. day videos. Yeah. Although it's funny because one of the biggest videos that we ever did uh, with Deep Review before was the X100V. The so, biggest. Yeah. yeah, it's the best. So yeah, it's funny that uh, people have a real hard on for this camera. They really love it. And I thought it was fine. It's because you don't like 35 millimeter. Well, that's, you know what I think it is? So uh, here's the thing. Uh, when we did the X100, Jared's V, right. I, I, I right. never really enjoyed the original X100s, you know, the T's, the F's. I mean, they were fine. I get it, but I didn't love them. And then the V was the first one where I was like, oh, I like the changes. I like the handling. I like the new image quality. This is a good camera. I like using it. Uh, so much so that it was like a surprise. So I think I talked it up a lot because I was really quite enjoyably surprised by this this new camera. And then the X106 came out and it's it's fine because it's basically an X105 with some updates. And I think the updates are great. The, the IBIS is fantastic. The new sensor is great. But it just isn't going to inspire the same joy because it's like, otherwise, it's an X105. I've already had that excitement. That excitement's gone and had babies and died. So, you know, now it's like... It's only it's, a four-year lifespan. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's like an insect. It's like a very quick kind of thing. And so it's a nice camera. I think it's fantastic. I think it makes a lot of sense for photographers. I think a lot of people enjoy it. Hopefully, they'll be able to produce more now that's made in China. But yeah, it's a good camera. But I, Jaren, you can hold on to it as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, this is uh, mine now. Um, I, I I really, I love this camera. So I did not get to experience the V. In fact, right. this is my first X100. I have very <sighs> limited experience with Fujifilm in general. I have never used a GFX camera. Uh, I have used some of the XT series. Um, but I, holding this, the second it came out of the box, I'm like, yeah. this is it. This is what I want. And I think some people have, so there's a, there's like a, a mixed reaction to this. There's folks who say that it's awesome. It's whatever it's, it's trend and it's trendy for, because people seem to really like it. And I think it, yeah. it really comes down to the film simulations that are built in. I think that is a huge advantage for Fujifilm because you can create art with this thing straight out of camera. And it also shoots to Heifs, Heifs, H-E-I-Fs now direct, We're which, is, it. which is really nice. <laughs> um, but then whenever you have anything popular, it is, just as popular, I argue, to be anti that. So it's like, if you can't, if you don't feel love for this and decide that you want to be trendy still, you will now then start hating on this thing online. That's, That's the, the way to we do live it. in. Jared. You have to pick one or the other. Um, there is no middle ground yeah, with this it, camera this, online, it seems. Which is to me very silly. Like, if you don't like something, move on. You don't need to sit here and like, I mean, hate I want to argue it. that I represent the middle ground on this camera. And okay. uh, you, I believe you guys chastised me for that. When did I do uh, that? I'm just saying. I did. That was me being like, what don't you love about this thing? It's perfect. I love this camera. Like, it's fine. But I'm, a I'm a 35 something. junkie too. Yeah, so. I also love 35. Chris is the minority here. Um, yes. When I was using this thing, I just felt happy. I think I think yeah. there are very few. I've, I've expressed this on the podcast before. There are very few cameras that make me excited to go take pictures. Um, like I'm very much burned out on taking pictures. I just enjoy things with my regular human eyes as opposed to looking through a viewfinder these days. But using this, I was like, I feel like taking a picture. I feel like making art for myself. And that's the thing too. I make art for me. I don't care what other people think. I'll, I'll print my own pictures and put them on my own wall. I don't need to impress anyone else with my work and I don't care if they like it or not. 
Um, yes, yes, Chris needs to impress people with his work. Yes, it's my job. <laughs> um, uh, I do want to throw out one thing that I wasn't expecting mm-hmm. that no one's really talking about that I loved with that camera. Uh, everybody forgets it is a hybrid optical electronic viewfinder. Most people wind up, I think, just using it as an electronic viewfinder the as vast you majority should. of the time. Uh, it's more practical and everything. But I had a great time using the optical viewfinder combined with the new tracking algorithm because I have never used an optical viewfinder that'll track an object right to the edges of the frame. So my daughter's just running around. And that's a very cool, you know, very connected experience, but where I'm not constantly fighting with the limitations of an optical, you know, where I got to keep my subject right in the middle of the frame or whatever. Uh, I really enjoyed that shooting experience. And but being I the do centrist think- that I am, yes, you didn't love the video, which makes sense. It's not, it's not a great sensor for it. That, that's the exact limitation. I was shocked at how good the X105 was as a video camera. Like I looked silly with, you know, a two and a half millimeter to three and a half millimeter adapter beside a USB to three and a half millimeter adapter dangling off this itty bitty camera on a monopod when I filmed that episode. But, but the shooting experience and the quality was fantastic. Yeah. Um, and this camera, yeah, it's, it's a sensor that is a little slower to read out. There are more compromises with it compared to the other one. But you've got, you know, the better video profiles on it you have tap to track which is going to make it a lot more usable for just like you know the kind of stuff this camera is for just quickly capturing little moments so it's going to be tough Uh, i want to spend more time with the camera to say like definitively you know is the five or the six the better video camera and that's why we will do a long-term review of this yeah when jaron sends this camera up (laughs) and we don't give it back to him and we keep it forever this one (laughs) that i'm holding here uh will not go back to you this no this you will get your own uh sent this is not yeah, technically yeah. a production body. That's um, true. So this is a pre-production body, even though it is now running 1.0 firmware. Um, we are going to wait for, I think, the first firmware update after this comes out, and then you guys will get it to do yeah. your review, and you can spend your time with it. Um, uh, I will write the review, though, because I feel very strongly about this camera. There were a couple questions I wanted to answer uh, about this that I've seen on YouTube. One of them was like, is, does the how's the lens performing with the sensor? Great. Beautifully. Yeah. No yeah. Problem. No problems at all. Sharpie, sharp, sharp, sharp. I will say, how is it performing with the autofocus? I will also, I will reduce that from great to good. Um, Mm. I think I haven't had problems with it, uh, like getting what I want it to get. Like if I'm pointed at something and I, and I want that to be the point of focus, it's getting it. Um, But I won't say that this lens is fast. It's, it's fine. Right. It's, it's yeah, I, I brought it to that same BMX competition. And when things are very quickly moving towards it, like the autofocus is tracking it, the box is on the subject. It's just the lens the can't lens move came, fast yeah. enough. But yeah, yeah, like, I think that is it's, the that is an unusual use case uh, for this camera. I no think. one's shooting BMX they, and they with a X106. <laughs> and they shouldn't, yeah. No, that's a lunatics game. Um, I'm, very, but, yeah. I'm very curious to see what happens with this camera. You know, the X105 had V. Uh, it had such... Uh, a huge following became incredibly popular. And I wonder if that's because it was so hard to get. Like it really was a classic example of basic economic supply and demand where people just started to really pine for this camera more so when it was difficult to get. I mean, people liked it when it was available, but when it really started to take off, it had already been on the market for a while and people just started to love it and they could not keep up with demand. And I wonder like objectively the six is a better camera in pretty much every way, shape and form except video. Yeah. And so I wonder though, if the same draw is going to be there, uh, considering that the, you know, technically the six should have, well, technically I'm assuming should have an easier time with production. So I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see, so we'll a couple of things on that. So first, as far as like pre-orders go, I do know that Amazon sold out of their pre-order allotment yeah, and that Amazon huge. is run by Fujifilm. So it's the Fujifilm store. So they sold all on Amazon in the US, however many they were going to do. Um, I, I know that some other dealers have reached their allotment number. Yes. Um, Moment, who makes lenses for smartphones, they also have a shop. I don't know if you guys even knew that you could buy stuff mm-hmm. that's not made by Moment there. Uh, they have the X106 for sale, like you can pre-order it through them. And I think that might be a very good option to do um, mm-hmm. because they're not as popular as like a BNH and h or an Adorama. And they do have a, an allotment. Now, I don't know how, how their shipping is going to work. They, all, they come in like, I've, I'm assuming that they come in waves, like everyone gets a certain amount and they have to ship them out whenever. But I don't think that this will be that hard to get. But that said, I have seen people try to sell these already for like $2,500 or more <laughs> uh, on the second hand market. Wow. Don't, if you're listening to this and you really want this camera, just be patient. I promise yeah. you that they will hit their, 
their allotments and this will become readily available. So like it's worth waiting and not spending the extra money. Finally, there's one last note I wanted to make before we move on, and it's the IBIS. Some folks are like, I don't need IBIS in this camera. Why not? I will, Madness. I will argue that it opens up a way to shoot that I couldn't shoot with this before. Even though I didn't use the X105V, uh, I know that I wouldn't be able to get these shots because I have shaky coffee hands. So I did a couple long exposures handheld during the middle of the day to get like motion of people. And that kind of shot for like street photography, I love. I don't like necessarily showing people's faces in street photography. I think I, I would, I like the idea of people in the shots. I just don't want you to know who they are. I think that adds to like the mystique and the the, the beauty of a street photo to, to think that it could be anywhere or anyone. Um, and I like the ability to hand hold like down to a, you know, a one, mm. one over fourth of a second or less to try and get like a nice sharp background, but like moving bodies. And then doing that at night too is working for me. Cool. So you might not need IBIS, but I think having IBIS lets you do more. And I think yeah. that, that, is, that is a nice addition. What was the slowest shutter speed you think you got like a sharp result at on a 35 millimeter equivalent? Uh, one fourth? One, one over nice. Four. Is that one fourth of a second? I was just thinking about this and my brain broke. Like, right. so is it? So it's one over 30th of a second, one over 15th of a second, one over eighth of a second, and one over fourth of a second. Is that one fourth of a second? Yeah. I don't think it is, yeah. is it? Yeah. It is? Okay. So it's one fourth of a second. I don't know. I, yeah. I, I started thinking about it too hard. And then I, it's like saying a word in English over and over again and it starts sounding wrong. Like, I, I just, did that to myself. I would just add, though, that like, even if you get the sharpest, most technically perfect image out of like your beautiful subject matter, something very compelling and emotive, it was still on a 35. So like, does it even matter? Like, is it even Okay, I'm going to take that as a cue to move on. Is it uh, <laughs> Stop it. 35 is great. Get out of here. Uh, the other thing is that in addition to the X106, Fujifilm did a couple of other things that are kind of quietly less, less like, you know, I mean, it's hard to be louder than the X106, but they announced that they are working on a new lens. It's a reimagining, I think, of an old lens, the XF 16 to 50, F 2.8 to 4.8. So that will be coming. They didn't say when. They just said that that's what it is. That's the next lens they're working on. But they are also doing an, uh, firmware updates for other cameras, including yeah. bringing the new Reala Ace profile to the X-H2S, the X-H2, the X-T5, and the X-S20. So one of the questions that we had for Fujifilm going into CP Plus was, are you going to bring... What happened to Kaizen? It's like they stopped <laughs> for years. And this, it feels like what they... You know, we still get bug, bug fixes from Fujifilm, but now we're seeing actual features added to the cameras again. And it seemed like we did a video back with DP review where Chris was like chucking an X 100 V in the garbage saying like, what happened to guys? <laughs> <laughs> that was a fun thumb. Um, but it's true. Like we weren't seeing those major feature updates. So I think that's kind of the big story of this aside from the X 106 is the return of like major feature updates, like tap to track video coming to older bodies too Touch is really cool. Yes. AF to the yeah. XH2S, the yeah. XH2, the XT5 and the XS20. And then there's a red frame indicator for recording coming to the uh, XH2S and the XH2. Nice. If we complain well. about stuff long enough, people will fix it. So there you go. <laughs> um, I am very curious about that new kit lens as well, because we just did our rundown of, you know, the best kit lenses of all time. Uh, and, you know, right near the top, I think it was number two, is that legendary XF 18 to 55, 28 to 4. I think early days of mirrorless, that lens was a big factor in Fujifilm getting so much market share. Cause you could be like, here's a Sony uh, with a garbage kit lens. And here's a Fujifilm <laughs> with a beautiful kit lens. Which one do you want? And a lot of people, the smart ones went Fuji <laughs> in those early days. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there, this is going to have to be a great lens to maintain that legacy. And I'm surprised it's a little bit it slower, a, but I'm happy a, that it's wider. That's should great. Be a big year for Fujifilm. Hey, uh, I'm getting the sense that, they're going to do a lot this year. Um, so keep an eye right. on this space. Let's keep going. Uh, next thing to talk about. Let's stop talking about Fujifilm for a little bit. And let's talk about Sigma. We have a lot of Sigma yeah. things to talk about this week. Yes. Uh, yeah. So let's start with what they announced for CP Plus, which were two opposite ends of the spectrum lenses. <laughs> so Chris, tell me what they are and your thoughts. 
Yeah, very different ends. So one was the Sigma 15 millimeter diagonal fisheye, F1.4, something we've never seen before on the market, full frame. Uh, and at first I was, I was really like, okay, who is this for? Like, what, what, why do this? But really, the more that I played with it, I mean, it, it really shows that Sigma, I think with the 15 mil, is trying to basically show, hey, like, we're a world-class optics manufacturer. I think all that third-party stuff needs to go. Like, Sigma really is like a premier lens there, manufacturer. There, there is, it's very strange. And, I, and, and, and yeah. Kazuto Yamaki, the, the CEO of Sigma, I spoke to him, and like, he, he agrees he's with He's the best. Yeah, he's yeah. awesome, by the way. Uh, he came in and was essentially like, we knew we weren't going to sell a lot of these. We made this yeah. for like a handful of very specific astrophotographers and those who specifically also shoot northern lights because like you want to be able to have a faster shutter speed at night yeah. to actually get a nice picture of that um but he's like we made this to prove that we could do it and do it yeah. better than and as good or better than a first party camera manufacturer and he's like the idea of third party yeah that's what they are but it's also like we are a we want to be a master yeah. of optics we want yeah, to be like, not a budget kind of you know no. you lose quality but you save money kind of that 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 whole thing is way in the past way way in i the remember past. uh when we went to photokina chris together you had the opportunity to interview him yeah and he said very specifically we want to be zeiss uh, which yeah. is really interesting because Zeiss is really no longer producing photographic lenses. But that idea kind of left that market. But yeah, it's like yeah. nobody looked at a Zeiss as like a budget third party lens option. They were no. just known for like incredible optics. And now Sigma is really, and honestly, all the third parties are stepping up. Like Tamron makes yeah. some of the best zooms Fantastic. ever made. Um, yeah, but yeah, those Sigma lenses. art primes are just and, stunning. And lenses. let's remember like high end quality, but without like Zeiss prices. You know what I mean? Like they really are still reasonable lenses. You know, the 15 mil. Keep in mind, you already have an excellent 14 mil 1.4, which we love. And that was also made for astrophotographers, low light landscape, you know, very little coma, no sagittal astigmatism was really well corrected. The 15 mil surprisingly does the exact same thing. Like it's perfect for astrophotography. Quality is beautiful. Although we didn't get a chance to shoot it ourselves. It, the results are there. Um, and so it is made for select few people that want the diagonal fisheye look for astrophotography. Or, I mean, I, I think it also has applications like we used it for doing interior architecture, doing like low light concert stuff. Uh, some people might like it for funky stuff for weddings and events, you know, certainly video work for music videos or maybe some sports. But, I, you know, is this going to be a lens that people rent maybe more than buy? Probably. But yeah. if you really like that kind of curvature of the earth kind of look with a huge field of stars, I mean, this is the lens to get and nobody else makes anything like it. Mm -hmm. Arguably, going back to what you said about them being like a like a like a Zeiss, both of these lenses which, by the way, I asked him, like, is, was it on purpose that you that Sigma released a 15 millimeter and a 500 millimeter on the same day? It's like, actually, no, that was by accident. <laughs> the uh, 15 was, I believe he said that was in process longer. Like, they've been working on it for a longer amount of time. It just happened to announce, re be ready at the same time as the 500. Yeah. Both of these lenses are not cheap, but also performant that you would expect from a first party camera manufacturer. Is that, 100%. Which was, yeah, because you, you yeah. really like the 500. Yeah, the 500 is another perfect example of that. So F5.6, I mean, a lot of manufacturers now are making these slower primes. You know, 5.6 is not slow, not slow, slow, but... Not outside, You know, these not. slower, it's slow, but, you know, these slower primes, but the, the the benefit is, of course, very compact, super lightweight. That 500 is so nice to carry around. Um, and optically, it is one of the most perfect lenses that we've tested in a long time. I mean, it's 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 got basically... I can't think of any real downsides optically. I mean, the flare is always well controlled. There's no loca. Focus is quick. I mean, the thing is sh insanely sharp, wide open at 5.6. Um, you could put a teleconverter on. That's maybe the only downside is the 5.6 aperture, of course, does cause some issues as far as what kind of converters we can put on it. You can, but you're going to lose a lot of light. Um, and that's L mount only. That's only L mount. E -mount yeah. You can't yet. Yeah. The other complaint I've seen on this on E mount is that you're limited on your frames per second too, because Sony doesn't with Sony. Let you, yeah. Doesn't let you do it. It's true, but 15 frames per second is still really good, right? If it was five or something, I'd be really upset, but 15 is still plenty. We took it out shooting wolf dogs, and I mean, the lens is so sharp, like so good optically. Focus was bang on with the Sony bodies that we tested. Um, yeah, so they made another basically perfect lens, and there's not a lot of, of fixed primes, you know, certainly available in those two mounts, like as much as you might find with, with Nikon, for example, or, or Canon. So it's, it's, I think it's a nice, it's a nice fit. 
Yeah, I mean, that's the front runner for me right now. For It's only like February, but for Lens of the Year at this point, uh, that's going to be yeah. one that I'm going to remember when we get to the end of the year for sure. Yeah, it's not sexy, but it's it's so nice to carry around and it's like optically stunning. Yeah, stunning. Well, let's talk a little bit about Sony because Sony did have an announcement. Yes. And Chris was eh, on it. It's the <laughs> 24 to 50 F2.8 G. You're just like, eh. <laughs> that's that's the I, I i watched your review and i read your article and what i got from that was eh. yeah it's interesting like it's you know you, no matter what you say i think there's always this this sort of aspect to reviewing gear that's hard to communicate maybe easier on youtube than it is uh but i think jaron just did a great job yeah he did <laughs> no no i guess what i'm saying is this like it's a lens. As, a, as a gear reviewer we look at specs of course we look at values we look at data those are all important things we evaluate image quality that kind of stuff but there's also just uh your initial impression like you know that's kind of a cool thing about photography your your first impression is the same as if you meet a person or go for a job interview or something i mean picking up a piece of gear i think every camera reviewer and i would say honestly any any consumer you have this experience where you touch it and sometimes there's something about it that's just inexplicable that you're like oh this feels right or i just love the way it looks or i just want to own it i want to covet it yeah it's and there's an sometimes pieces sex, of yeah. gear you pick up and you're like meh you know what did you say <laughs> he said that what you just described is an x100 six and i'm laughing because i agree but yeah, you don't yeah you so, know, okay, but, uh, specifically this 24 to 50, why I is picked it-, it up and I was like, ah, and, and, and here's the thing I will say before I go, I'll let you talk, but no, I don't the 24 talk. to 50 is full featured. Like, I love the fact that you get customizable buttons, aperture rings. I mean, it's really well made and sealed. Uh, so it's just funny though. There was something about, it. I was like, why? And I think Jordan actually does like this kind of focal range, shorter <laughs> wide to normal than I do. I don't find as much use. <laughs> So I've always said, like, my jam is the ultra wide to normal lens. And this isn't quite there, you know. So what, 18 to 35? 18 to 50? Uh, so the 20 to 50 Sigma, the um, 17 to 50 Tamron, that's my jam kind of right in there. Like the 24 is just a fairly standard, you know, um, and I'm losing a little bit on the long end with it. The big thing for me is I just wasn't super impressed with it optically where we've been, I think we even did it in our rundown of the year where we were ranking every manufacturer where like Sony is just delivering like every time we see new optic, yeah. like, wow, this is a new benchmark. Um and I was kind of surprised when we were initially briefed on it. They were like, uh, okay, so I want to show you guys how this lens compares to the original 24 to 70 G Master, which is not a very well regarded no, lens. No, it's bad. That's why they, yeah, that's why they updated to the version right. two. So right there, I already had warning signs going off a little <laughs> bit. Like, yeah, why don't we compare this to an optic from the last seven years? That would be great. And, uh, and yeah, we just weren't super impressed once I saw those charts, seeing some longitudinal chromatic aberration, which I'm not used to seeing from Sony yeah. glass. Uh, I was, it's like they brought back one of the old lens designers and they were like, take another stab at it. And then, <laughs> you know, this wonder can bl- 24. Yeah, yeah. This wonder lens designer that they've got off in the corner <laughs> is like, I guess I'll sit this one out. But, uh, I think yeah. they wanted to make something small, which they did. It makes sense. Yeah. yeah. For the it's A7C light. series. Yeah. It's small. I could absolutely see it being a, you know, kind of useful lens for, uh, like an event photographer on a budget. You know, you, you maybe don't have the money for a 2470 G master version. But isn't two. this actually kind of expensive? Uh, yeah, it's it's yeah. not cheap. Like yeah. uh, I, I believe eleven hundred dollars, which is very close to the twenty to seventy. Uh, which was uh, was that lens of the year or runner? Uh, yeah, so th- I think I chose his lens of the year for me. Anyway, yeah. yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, even if you let's say you decided to go not first party, mm-hmm. there are other options and from Tamron yeah. too, right? That are probably more performant. And cheaper. That's what I'm saying. It's it's a lens for people who maybe don't want to spend two and a half thousand dollars on a G Master, which I totally understand. But they still have that desire for a two eight lens. Um, but yeah, I I do think the twenty seventy f four, even though you lose a stop light, is infinitely more useful. Or you have lenses like the twenty eight seventy five Tamron G two, which is a, a great lens. Yes, it's not twenty four mil, but it does give you far more reach. It's only a hundred grams heavier, so it's not like it's appreciably heavier, right? Like, yeah. and it's it's brilliant optically. Yeah. The other one that we get brought up all the time is the Tamron twenty to forty, which is bizarre. It is the only lens of theirs from the last like six years that we never got center review yeah. copy 20 for. to 40 so that's bizarre 
yeah. the 20 to 40. So maybe I need to just pop by the camera store, shoot a chart just so we know how to compare it to other things. Um, because that does seem to be like a pretty popular yeah. lens. Weird for that you didn't get one. Right I can probably yeah, get you one. I mean, yeah, we could we're probably friends get with one too. Tamron. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. but 2450, not a bad lens at all. Not it, a bad just, lens. Not a great lens. It's, it's just, just in just the middle. It just doesn't. I don't know where it fits and I feel like it's a very competitive field where it does try to fit and there's lots of other options. So the consumer really has to do their due diligence and really look around and make sure that is still the one that you want. All right. Um, I'm starting to feel pretty good about my bold prediction last year. I don't know about you guys, but I, I feel <laughs> strong. Your because Foveon? My Foveon prediction because I talked to, I talked to him about a lot of stuff, uh, Kazuto Yamaki, and he says... That Foveon is not coming this year. It's not coming next year. It's not even coming the year after that. We are <laughs> a liter- We are at least three years away from seeing the camera. If everything goes perfect from this point forward, there can be right. no other issues. Like so, for example. So I let, let, let me let me back up a little bit. That's the story. Sigma's full frame Foveon camera is at least quote a few years away. And uh, the reason being is the they've been stuck at that same stage that they've been at since 2022. Yeah. Um, the they they found an error in the way that their prototype was rendering, and these prototypes apparently take like six months between deliveries. So when they found an error, they had to fix the error. Then they had to send the the new spec out. Then it had to get remade, and they haven't even received that prototype yet. They're expecting to get that one in like this summer they'll have the most recent prototype. So then when that's done, they then have to upscale it to full frame because the prototype's not full frame. It's close. Right. So then they have to upscale it and then they have to find a manufacturing partner <laughs> and then they have to actually start mass producing it. So by the end of this, he's like, they still want to do it. They're still trying. But let me read the exact quote. I personally cannot guarantee to go to mass production at this moment, but the engineers yeah. are still working hard. I'm in camp of we'll never see it. And I'm okay yeah. with that. I think I like that they're still trying. I, I can approve <laughs> of that, but I I don't I don't see it. Thoughts? I, I think it's interesting. If that timeline is correct, it will be a decade between Foveon on camera oh, releases. Okay. Yeah. Between releases, yes. This camera's yeah. been in development since twenty sixteen. Yeah. I get you know, I I feel like I'm often the more optimistic one out of us three when it comes to this stuff. And in this case, I'm actually gonna be a pessimist. I mean, like why do we even need a new Foveon sensor? At this uh, point. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's not like it was ultra compelling even back when it was a contemporary sensor to the competition. And now we it, it's going to be crazy expensive, um, very niche. I also feel like in a few years, I mean, maybe we're going to start seeing a lot of organic sensors hitting the market and they're going to bring a whole bunch of advantages. I don't know. Like, oh, Well, that's funny. On that note, I do have an update from that. I haven't written that story yet, but I talked to what? Panasonic about it. Yeah. <laughs> It's you know never, what I mean though it's ever, like ever, it's, never, it, ever. it's, never it's like if a Foveon arrives in two or three years like will anybody even want it I mean it it would have to like there are some like, Japanese tuck fans. you in at night it would have to like, <laughs> like it would even, have to like even if they you, do give you some ASMR stuff and even if they do release it I, I feel like Sigma would sell it at a loss they would never make money on this yeah. camera yeah. Yeah, it's, after all this time. After all this time, yeah. There's just no way. I feel I feel bad for them. And him. then I I'm, love Sigma. But are they going to put totally. in a camera which isn't made for human hands? I don't know. I, I don't have, know. Have we I discussed on this podcast uh, Kazuto-san's reasoning for continuing camera development? I feel like I've I know we've talked it. about it off mic. I, sh- yeah. I should have I should have confirmed that's still the reason when I was talking to him. But go ahead, Jordan. Why do they make? Why does he want to make a camera? So he made a joke on an interview. I think it was with Imaging yeah. Resource actually back in the day that um, his father always wanted to make cameras, made cameras when he ran the company, and he feels like if he stops camera development, his father will haunt him, <laughs> which is the best. <laughs> response yes. <laughs> ever <laughs> but i feel oh, like they man. gave they gave it a college try i mean we'll see what happens i mean if a company can do it sigma can do it i, I i'm not saying that they don't not, have the passion and they're definitely just a company that makes niche things. things they make yeah. niche stuff all the time so even if yeah. it doesn't even if they don't sell well he will at least have fulfilled his duty to Great. make I mean, hey, his obligation yeah. to family okay. you don't want to be haunted i get it oh man uh all right uh, moving on, Panasonic has a tiny, 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 itty bitty all in one can uh, all in one lens. It is yep. a 28 to 200 f4 to 7.1, and it is L mount's first all in one zoom. All in one zoom. 
Yeah, I think it, Chris probably has it over there right now, right? I do have it. I have it. And and it feels like, I don't know, it feels like 1989 all over again. You know, everybody's going to start making these giant super zooms that are very slow. I mean, the, the thing, it is compact um, and we are testing it. We're going to be doing a review here pretty shortly. I think the aperture is still going to be a thing, right? 7.1 is not fast at the long end. Um to its credit, I believe that it does push the aperture range scale farther towards. So I guess what I'm saying is you you tend to get a little bit more light throughout the mid to normal range than you might normally. But, yeah. you know, it's uh, it's it's a travel lens. Sure. Like it's it's compact. Absolutely. So I'll I'll be making judgments on is it worth it or, or who's it for? I think is really going to be the main story here. It's nine, yeah, I mean, $900 the big thing is, at the end of April, by the way, for anyone listening. Yeah, just curious. That's not crazy. Yeah. yeah There's crazy. nothing competing with it. That's the thing. You know, in L Mount right now, we haven't seen, like, the benchmark is that wonderful uh, Tamron 28 to 200, 28 to 56. But Tamron doesn't uh, make yeah. L Mount. Yeah. Tamron exactly. pretends it doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I, if you're in the market for that, it is really nice. The one thing I do want to say is on the thing that we were at that I can't talk about, I brought this lens because it said 28 to 200 macro on it. Uh, perfect. I can get my product shots and stuff like that with it. And it was a great lens to have, you know, nice and compact while I yeah. was roaming around. But when we got to the product shots, it's best macro is at the wide end at 28, 28. which is very difficult for product photography to light and everything like that. So it actually wasn't an ideal candidate for that. I wound up just shooting it in super 35 mode to get a little bit tighter and get those glorious shots that you'll all see in the future <laughs> of something that you can't talk about. Something that I can't talk about. Stop Jeremy. talking about it. Stop pretending that you can talk about it. All right. The next thing we're going to talk about that's not that is uh, <laughs> the original OM1 got a firmware update. Nice. Hey, so we did it, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did it. Uh, so here's a quote from OM System. Since the announcement of the OM System OM1 Mark II interchangeable lens camera on January 30th, there have been many inquiries regarding the possibility of a firmware update to the OM System OM1 released in March 2022. As a result, we would like to advise of our plan for a future firmware update for OM1. Uh, so it's going to improve the autofocus and nice. deliver improved operability by allowing users to assign the trash button as a menu access shortcut. Yeah, so some of the stuff that we said specifically. I don't know if you said this that. could be addressed in. That I, I don't think I touched on the right on the hand trash, trash button. Yeah, right. Oh, incompetent. <laughs> Who's going to take the fall for this, Chris? You or me? I. It's my fault. I. You know. Yeah. I was. Too, we. It was too busy talking about the forty-eight other features that that added. That you know, our video would have been eighty-six minutes long. So, yeah, I, what what did you say in your review of the OM1 Mark II that you thought could have actually been a firmware update? It was the autofocus improvement. Was well, there anything I, else? I would, the autofocus is important to talk about because that was probably one of the more compelling benefits that I saw in the OM1 Mark II. Because the, the OM system and Olympus, really, the tracking up to this point has been lackluster, 100%. So, the OM1 Mark II really improved their tracking performance. And so I would love to see that come to as many of their other cameras as possible. Cause I think that's a big tangible benefit. Um, yeah. I mean, other stuff is uh, there's a lot of stuff that could potentially be firmware improved. So I don't know, I guess we'll have to see if this firmware update does that. Some video features uh, they added were basically firmware updates already. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, I think Chris is right. When he did that thing, he was like, the autofocus alone might be grounds for updating. Now, they did say you're not going to get identical performance with the no. OM1 with the new firmware compared to the OM1 Mark II uh, because it does have that extra RAM in it. But if it's close, then that's great news. For like, That's going to be a massive update for people who, like I said yeah. on a previous podcast, you know, stuck their neck out and invested in a camera company that's very new to the market. And I think those people should be rewarded um, by getting, you know, as much in software as the hardware can deliver. Um, one last note on this. We, we kind of talked a little bit about this in previous podcasts about how OM System is uh, the spinoff from Olympus that is owned by Japan Industrial Partners, uh, who is also known for doing the same from Sony and Vio. Mm -hmm. um, I saw a Vio laptop while I was in Japan, by the way. It was wild. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the, I asked them, OM um, System in Japan, I asked them, so like, how involved is JIP, Japan Industrial Partners, in like your day-to-day? -day? And they're like, for like the first year, they're pretty involved. I think they wanted to know like their investment. They are pretty hands-off now. 
they basically are like, you guys are doing a good job, which tells me that that own system is profitable, um, that they are actually, you know, not requiring the financial overlords looming. So they, they said they meet with them about once a month now, which is well, a, yeah. not bad at all. That's, that sounds like just like a, a check in. And uh, yeah, so OM systems doing fine as far as I can tell. And as far as JIP can tell, they're doing fine. So that's good to know. <laughs> all right. Last thing. Uh, do you guys think Sigma should make medium format lenses? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah so does Kazudo. Kazudo also yeah, thinks yeah. they should do that. Because he's really, really smart and awesome yeah. and a great interview <laughs> and just a charismatic delight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's basically the whole story. He said that I'm personally very much interested in supporting medium format. It's a small market, but I have some interest. Up until now, we've been very busy to have a range of lenses for full frame mirrorless. So we have to have some of the regular stuff like a 24 to 70, 28, a 35, 1, 4, 50, 1, 4. But now that we have these lenses, that's why they started releasing unique products like the 500, 5, 6, and the 15, uh, 1, 4. Mm. So now we can expand the roadmap, he said. So some people took this to believe that they have, they've finished doing stuff like they've done all that they can for full frames and now they can focus elsewhere. That's not what he's saying. Yeah. He's saying yeah. that he's done the stuff that like, you know, people demand they must have. And now that yeah. they have it, now he can like, now they can play. They can do some other stuff. So I would expect them to keep making stuff for full frame. Mirrorless. That's because we have yeah. a Foveon medium format camera coming out from Sigma in 15 years. It's going to be incredible. <laughs> oh my God, medium format. No, I loved your your question there in the article. Just like, well, you're the boss. Can't you just yeah. make <laughs> them make medium format <laughs> lenses? Like, tell like, them yeah. to do it. <laughs> he's like, yeah, <laughs> I guess I could. But yeah, he, he needs to evaluate the market basically. But like, come on. Come on, Kazudo. You like you made a 15 millimeter f1.4 fisheye. You're gonna sell infinitely more anything you make for the GFX than uh, yeah. you would for that. I also I think wonder it's how that. protective the manufacturers would be, though the medium format companies. Like, That's the other thing I was about to say. They yeah, make yeah. some expensive lenses, like Hasselblad. They don't want Sigma lenses. No, I, I, I doubt think. it would be for Hasselblad. It would probably be for Fujifilm. Because it would need a leaf shutter and they as would, well if it goes nasty. Yeah. So they, yeah, but GFX. um. We haven't seen an autofocus. There's lots of third-party GFX lenses. I don't think we've seen an autofocus one yet. They would have to come to so an agreement probably with Fuji, up against that. Yeah. Can you imagine if Sigma came out with like three nice leaf shutter primes for GFX tomorrow? They would make a killing. Uh oh, <laughs> man. Every GFX shooter, just give them a functioning leaf shutter lens. Yeah. Why is yeah, Fuji that'd Fuji be amazing. a leaf shutter? It's oh. madness. They're throwing away such a big chunk of the market. Anyways. On that note... That's it. That's the that was hey, the week. I mean, that my, was CP Plus. I say that's it. Like that was nothing. That was a lot. There's a lot. more to so come. So much cool gear. I, I did interviews with Canon, and as a preview for that, they, we talked about the Apple Vision Pro with Canon. We also talked about third party optics. We did lots of stuff, and I have right. more to share, but that will come uh, down the line. Also, Very I talked exciting. to Panasonic, and uh, they have some stuff to share too. So. It'll be a couple more weeks of stories that we can get out that uh, CP Plus has granted us. So that nice. was fun. Here, here's what I want to know, Jaron. So what is the vibe you got talking to all those people? Because the impression that I'm getting is 2024 is going to be a huge year in like the photo video space. Are you getting that impression as well? Uh, at least from some of them. Um, Canon is very, they play things pretty close to the, is it to the chest or to the vest? I'm never really sure to what the that chest. is. To the chest. Yeah. Okay. They you play, can play poker and not wear a vest. Okay. So. They keep, they play things close. Um, they were, but they were surprisingly candid about a couple of things uh, once we asked, but that was the most formal interview I have ever been in. It was wild. So when you asked me how, how I thought those people acted like, or how it went, like we had, we, I, we ran the gamut of, people we had Kazuto in his his gray suit he just like bounds into the room and he sits down by himself and just having a conversation then there's the om guy in a t-shirt then there's the uh the the lumix dudes were two dudes i'd never met before young guys also in just like super casual clothes just hanging out then there's canon right. where is the most business formal thing ever where they had an official translator and some dude with a stopwatch on time next to me and then like three attendants off to the side and name <laughs> tags in front of them it was it was very nice. formal. I felt like I couldn't breathe without asking for permission. Um, so like, yeah, they have the little memory erase thing from men in black, like ready to go <laughs> yeah. in case someone says something That's they're right. not supposed to. Yeah. Um, but I did get a sense that all of them are feeling good. Like all of them right. are like, this is a, this is a fun time to be in the industry. Like, except for Canon who didn't 
actually express a lot of fun. Express fun. Yeah, they they just expressed existence and <laughs> the, doing stuff. doesn't do fun. We're still it's, here. It's it's just very corporate. Um, very yeah. Japanese corporate. That have um, always been that way though. Dave. Yeah, Canon's yeah. always been that way. Yeah. So, but yeah, I, I would quiet. say that there that this year should be very exciting, which is crazy because last year was extremely exciting too. Like last did year, you, uh, did you stuff. play with the Apple Vision Pro? There wasn't one there. We, oh. talk, we talked to Canon about their thoughts oh. on it. and Because uh, I can't the, wait to, to try one out and just like sit on my toilet, but project myself like in a tropical jungle with all the sound. He's been talking about this while a While having a conversation with my AI girlfriend. I can't wait. So I, I propose they're giving the, like Jeremy's already done it. They're doing those like demos at Apple stores. I propose all three of us go. Um in the near future, maybe for next week's podcast. And I want us all to have ideas. But will they let me take one to the toilet? No, they won't. No, they won't, Chris. Well, then I don't want to go. Oh, my God. Does Apple even have toilets? They don't have garbage cans. We learned that when we went to They have attended. Very unattractive. Um, (laughs) All right, so... What have we been up to? Well, uh, you all know what I've been doing. I was in Japan last last week. I Eating played, natto. Eat, I, I want did, three highlights of Japan. I did not see natto anywhere. I what? was very disappointed. What? Not on the breakfast? I it's went, usually like on the breakfast. So the, we were staying at the new Otani Hotel, and they have four places oh. to have breakfast. The And I'm sure you guys have stayed there if you've been to a Fuji. Yeah, you, they, they put you in the new there. Otani again? That's yeah, a beautiful yeah, yeah. hotel. By that the way, Japanese garden's gorgeous. The, that hotel, I don't think they have a functioning like... Uh, like individualized air conditioner for each room. Right. The tower is the temperature that the tower is and whatever you set your fan to in your room, <laughs> that's just that's a lot. That's what lie. you get. Um, at any rate, there's four <laughs> places to eat. All uh, Three of them had very, all four of them had very similar things, but they like shifted some stuff. But natto was nowhere to be found on any of the menus. So I was very disappointed. Oh, but you wanted highlights, Jordan? Yeah, three. Uh, one highlight was that bowl of maguro the tuna that I told you about earlier. Oh, yeah. yeah. The the death row tuna. Death yeah. row tuna. The second one was doing uh, very unusual cocktails uh, with Richard. Richard took me to this cocktail bar in uh, Ginza where nice. it, uh, the menu is a fruit basket. So you point <laughs> to a fruit and he'll make you a cocktail based on that fruit. And I asked him how wow. many in his mind does he have for each fruit? And he's like, oh, tons. Endless. Endless. Yeah. Wow. yeah he can keep going. Um, last one, I have to think a little bit more about another, another, I you mean, didn't I, go to a, a secondhand anime store in I, Akihabara like we did where you I, could look at secondhand hentai. You didn't that's do that. Super weird that you did that. No, I didn't. I oh. did. I did go to a special, so it's called, um, cause Tamashi, we saw that Tamashi nations, which is, it was a show floor for Gundam and Gunpla. So I got to see a bunch of scenes nice. from my favorite from my favorite Gundam, which is Gundam Seed, because they're doing a thing for that now for the movie. Um, that is, that showed like a bunch of scenes reenacted in Gunpla, and I, that was great. I have like a little booklet I got there, a special edition book that shows like all the stuff for the anyway. It was great. So that would be my third thing. I got to ah. do that. And I went there with Richard, who uh, was uninterested. That's past and future guest Richard Butler yes. uh, from DP Review, yeah. who rules. Yeah. My highlight was getting Jordan to say Genshin Impact. In Japan? Yes. Can you say that? It took Jordan? a lot of coaching. Genshin Impact 2. <laughs> okay, no, it's not I, a 2. It's just to. He's uh, out of practice. Uh, he's out of practice. Uh, <laughs> I think this is what Chris was correcting me on as well yeah. at that point. I assumed it was a sequel. Uh, all right. What have you guys been up to? And you, you said you had something, Jordan. Oh. Uh, yeah, I got something. So uh, I went snowboarding with my kid the other day. Haven't been in years. Had an absolute blast. I am now completely broken shell of a man uh, after that because uh, I had a crash for the first time in a really long time. So I was going down my kid and I like side by side. He's a great skier now. So we're just like, he's keeping up with me. We're having a great time and I'm, I'm throwing him under the bus here. This kid swerves right in front of me. I try to stop. I'm on a snowboard. He's on skis, huge collapse. I land on my wrist, bang my head really hard, all that. And, uh, this woman comes up and she's like, oh, my God, that was that was horrible. Are you OK? And I said, like, uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. And she's like, I'm talking to the child. <laughs> <laughs> Your own child. Yeah. yeah which, uh, you know, I know what he looks like when he's really hurt. So I was like, oh, he's just a little, a little startled, <laughs> but we're fine here. But yeah, in wow. that moment, I probably came off. Um, and she didn't even know I was his dad yet at that point. So that's even a, a worse, uh, you know, example of parenting. Wow, Jordan. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Anyways, had a great time. I'm going to try and go more often. I think I'm going to go pick up a snowboard too and get back into that because I what? really enjoyed it. Had no, a great that's time. That's good. Uh, the other thing I want to quickly touch on um, that I think really pertinent for photographer photography fans listening to this is um, my my buddy Bayrod, uh, who's actually he was on our old TCS live show reviewing the a9 uh, as a on set photographer camera. But dear friend of mine, he's been like an AD on movies I've done. Uh, he launched a new podcast called uh, Crisis and Victory, where he's talking to people in or adjacent to the healthcare industry um, about like their experiences and things, which is yeah, it's a very interesting podcast. But the reason I bring it up here is he just had our friend Leah Hennel, who is one of my absolute favorite photographers in Canada, on to talk about her experience. She went from photojournalism to working for Alberta Health Services right before the pandemic hit. Uh, and she has released uh, a book called Alone Together. Um, mm. That's like a yeah, it's a great, really book. incredible, like black and white documentation. The access she had is unbelievable. And you've, Jaren, you've seen a bunch of her pictures. Um, very famous one of like a doctor kneeling with his head in his hands, calling family uh, and stuff like that. Absolutely incredible work. So she went on there, and they didn't talk. You know, I listen to a lot of photography interviews, but so much of it's like you know gear or photographic technique and this is really interesting in that they talk a lot about like ethics and mm. things like that of it like have there been times where you've had the camera up to your eye and you've chosen not to take shoot the shutter and mm. stuff like that uh just an excellent and really insightful interview so yeah it's it's called crisis and victory is the podcast listen to the leah hannell episode and i grabbed one of her books along the western front i have right here uh which is kind of like outside of you know, the farm living around Alberta here. Um, but uh, I wasn't able to find Alone Together because we keep, when people come over, we're like, look at this damn book. This thing's amazing. <laughs> so I don't know where it is in our house right now. Um, but yeah, check that out as well. Definitely give it a listen. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, these are both dear friends of mine. So uh, I'm a little biased, but I thought it was great. So that is my plug for this week. Cool. Nice. Um, Chris, are you going to- quick then. I'll be right. quick then. Uh, I did a volleyball tournament. Well, my kids' volleyball tournament. I had to sit through that. Yeah, I want to see you do a volleyball tournament. Yeah, I would. I couldn't do it, but that was that was what I did for the weekend. And uh, my wife and I are on an Alexander Payne kick right now. Yeah, we'll talk about that more re uh, soon. But um, I just wanted, you know, so Michael the Maven, uh, Michael Andrews, he makes these filters. Jordan and I both used them, and I don't talk about them enough. So I thought I would talk about them because I just got the new seventy-two mils that he sent. These are magnetic adapted. 72 mil is going to go on my OM-1-2 and EM-1 Mark III um, on, that, uh, on that beautiful uh, 12 to, to 100. And uh, what I like about this, it's so quick to click on and off. No screwing, just click on, click off. And it's a three-stop plus circular polarizer. So I'm excited to use that for the fishing stuff. Not so useful for our show, but certainly for the fishing stuff. And that's about it. I, nothing else really exciting. I love those filters as well. Yeah, uh, I was really happy to filters. see some fresh ones after just decimating them in Idaho <laughs> uh, when those were <laughs> but attached if, if you're to a camera, for... spraying gravel, and oh, God, yeah. like nothing could survive that. So, if you're looking yeah. for clear filters, like neutral color filters that are well-made and very easy to take on and off, it's a really nice, very simple system. I like it a lot. Uh, before we move on to tech support, Chris, are you going to watch Shogun? I think it's available now. I absolutely want to watch Shogun so bad. Yes, okay. Absolutely. I'm going to probably watch it this week. You should watch it this week. Too. Is it starting now? Yeah. I just saw it when I turned this oh. TV on to put the fireplace on. It's like it said Hulu streaming now. So I'm like, all right, oh, I'm going to watch that. Oh, yeah. Um, I want to watch Shogun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, like that reminds me. What, what have I been watching? I mean, Masters of the Air. It's all right. Um, but uh, Formula One, Drive to Survive, back season six. I'm, I'm a poser completely when it comes to Formula One. But I do love this show. Like I watch it; it's so good. It's it's actually very compelling to watch, even if you don't really care about racing. And uh, yeah, that's been great. So I'm working through that. I watched all of Trigun Stampede. That is a, a it's an anime. animation. It's a an oh, thank you series. Yeah. Just so you yeah. know, yeah. All right, tech support time. All Let's, right, we got lots. We we do have a lot, so we may not get through all these this week. That's fine because. Uh, the backlog is not as heavy as it used to be. So the first one is from Jay on Spotify. What is ISO invariance and uh, for the first question? And the second question is, and how weather resistant are <laughs> modern mirrorless bodies? C camera companies just say weather sealed in quotes on their website, but there's no evidence for that claim. 
Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you do no ISO? through line between those two questions yeah, do, whatsoever. <laughs> do ISO and variance first, and then the second one I have some input on. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so ISO and variance is, is pretty simple. I mean, I guess to, to keep... Well, it's not simple. It's actually quite complicated, but to keep it simple... <laughs> To keep it simple, sensors used to basically bake in uh, ISO. Like, if you shot at a higher ISO, you're going to bake in a certain amount of of noise. It was increasing the amplification of the sensor. Yeah, introducing you're boosting noise. the amplification of the sensor, right? Adding more noise, and that's basically permanent. With an ISO invariant sensor, the idea is that you don't have to do that at the time of shooting. You don't have to bake it in. What you can do is you can leave the sensor at its base native ISO. And then although the exposure is going to be quite dark, if you go in post afterwards, you can amplify it in post and you'll get basically the exact same image quality as if you had raised the ISO in the first place. The benefit being that by not raising the amplification at the time of shooting, first off, you can protect your highlights a lot better, right? Because when you amplify ISO, you amplify shadows, midtones, and highlights. If you don't amplify those things, the highlights can stay well protected, and then you can just bring up the shadows and midtones afterwards. That's a huge advantage. Also, just the advantage that you don't have to make a, a, a permanent decision at the time of shooting. You can do it afterwards. That being said, not many people still choose to shoot that way. I think most people still tend to shoot the classic way of matching their ISO for the exposure needs. Um but yeah, th- that's a very simplistic way of saying it. Uh, well, I want to do a whole podcast yeah. about how manufacturers could make it optimized so you can take advantage of that highlight information and they yeah. choose not to. Or give uh, you they a make preview. it very difficult to like perfectly expose your image. Okay, yeah. hold on. Before we forget, I'll put on the board right now. Podcast. April 3rd is the next available podcast for a new topic. <laughs> ISO invariance. Oh, yeah. If anybody has a hard time sleeping, I would tune into that one. It's yeah, gonna That's going to be a real popular episode that yeah. everyone is going to listen to start to <laughs> now, finish. Weather sealing is a really big one because you're right. This, you know, Jay, this is kind of the Wild West. Um, yeah. You asked, like, if there's a standard. That's the neat part. No, there's not. Yeah. Sometimes manufacturers will throw in an IPX rating, which is great because that does have. That's a real you know, rating. It's a real rating. But often you'll just hear people say things like dust resistant, moisture resistant. And then with an asterisk that says not, not, not guaranteed to actually resist all dust or water. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, you know, yeah, it's, and what kind of dust, right? I mean, the dust that we experienced in Idaho on the McCall trails is so fine and deadly to camera gear. It can get in anywhere. Whereas, you know, the dust around your house or whatever, who cares? So yeah, it's, it's, it is the wild west. There aren't any standards really. And right now Mm. people can basically just say, like you could put in a piece of, of foam, closed cell foam uh, inside the barrel and say, oh, dust sealed. Right. Like it's, yeah, it's, it's so, the Wild West. on this note, actually, right before I left imaging resource, um, Dave Etchells, the guy who used to run imaging resource, who founded it had decided to try and actually do this. Yeah. He wanted to actually provide a real rating that standardized what everyone else was doing. That wasn't IP because IP was too much. Like it would, none of them would qualify except OM stuff. So he had built this machine that would drip water onto stuff that he could actually determine at what point it seeped in like spray and all that kind of it was well like a lot of these will basically are just protecting against rain so he was just saying like how much rain how much rain i've never found the like spraying a jet that useful because that's not a scenario that comes uh up to me that often it's It's like it depends what kind of photography there are drops of water coming from that's that's a valid argument chris some videography there's some spraying involved yeah um at any rate no there there is there's no there's no standardization. So when someone claims it's weather resistant, I mean, look at them like like the DiCaprio yeah. meme from Inception. Like I, I think <laughs> definitely like we need to put some pressure because there are a few like Leica and um, OM are putting actual IP ratings on lenses yes. and bodies, and we need to really start pushing. We should give a higher direction. thumbs up to anyone who yeah. is and I think actually we have. draw more attention to yeah, it. I think we have to some We've always real. talked up. Olympus and OM system. We've always talked to Pentax, who did a really good job. Yeah. We even used to torture test some Pentaxes uh, back in the day. And uh, Sony's lenses, their G Master series, have come a long way. But again, yeah, but it's how, like they're very well sealed. I mean, yeah, but how, how well? This nef- not enough to get an IPX or an IP rating? I don't know, dude. Like, you know, on our Idaho trip, we had some professional lenses. We don't need to really talk about the brands right now that had some issues that we were, already you know, previously. high end. 
<laughs> and, and we had some G Masters, which absolutely survived unscathed to that dust. So I was pretty impressed by that. There's one key thing you're missing there is that one of those lenses was generally pointed forwards towards the gravel spraying into it. The other one was pointed backwards where there was much less well, of the way of small know. rocks. But they, yeah, got oh. covered, they got covered yeah. in that everything fine particular. Was her, yeah, everything yeah, was. And we reference. zoomed and focused. Like they got used. I will yeah. Yeah. again reference the picture of the three of us where yes. Jordan looks like Mel Gibson. That's that's yes, how all we are not. <laughs> Us three are not. I, I, I know it's extra at work, but for the people watching the podcast, Jaron's going to put that picture. Oh, am I? I'm going to go find the Mel Gibson picture. You're going to go find right. it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Oh, it's Yawning yeah. Marmot again. Let's go to Yawning Marmot. Yeah, Yawning Marmot is back here again. This is from YouTube tech support question. How does Jordan white balance his shots when shooting the episodes of your show? Do you eyeball it or use a gray card, X right color passport? Thank you in advance. So the big thing there is auto white balance is my best friend when I'm doing photography. It's very easy to change in post if it's off uh, and you don't have to stress about it that much. Terrible thing for video because you'll have color shifting yeah. mid shot if you use auto white balance. So my general solution when I'm looking at this, most of the time I'm in sun, cloud, shade, or tungsten. So I'll use those defaults for it. And if I'm a little bit off, you know, I can generally push at 500 Kelvin one way or the other. Um, there are certainly times like recently, Chris and I were shooting beside like a bright orange um, light with a dark blue bridge right behind it. And in those cases, I will just manually dial in the Kelvin color temperature and even the tint sometimes yeah. uh, using the EVF. Do not use the LCD because the ambient <laughs> light is going to screw up your perception of that as well. Yeah. Um, and I'll dial it in that way. I used to use, I had an x ray I had three x right color checkers, all gone. No idea yeah. where those things went. They were, <laughs> they were great for testing lenses. I didn't find I actually used them that much for white balance because the log formats, they're so flexible now. I was going to say, uh, you've I can fix it. You've gotten a lot better at eyeballing. Uh, well, you always have been, but you've gotten much better. You eyeball everything. I do have an X-Rite color passport. I choose not to bring Give me. it because Jordan has lost three of them already. So uh, no, no, Jordan doesn't get to touch it. And uh, it's good that he's he's able to eyeball it anyway. So we're good. I, okay. I remember meeting it. with X-Rite and they said like, uh, how many would you like? And I was like, I, I don't know. Three. There's no way I'll ever burn through those. <laughs> Jokes on me. Lost. Sorry, I cut you off there, Jared. No, I used to. Um, to I, I still, when I shoot video, I'll eyeball it and I will use the manual Kelvin thing. So I will. I'll look. I think Panasonic has one where you could actually see like the color chart. I can't remember what it's yeah. called. I I would use that um, and set it because I used to do interviews and we would be sitting. So my light would not change. And also I was not really sure about the exact color temperature that I was getting. Um, so I would, I would dial it in by mm -hmm. hand, but I would not use a card. Uh, like some sort of heathen, I guess. <laughs> uh, all right. We're going to listen to a speak pipe. This one is from Hessel Fulkertsma. Uh, let's, let's listen in. Hi, better pixelites. My question is regarding dynamic range in relation to sensor size. So I've heard multiple times that medium format cameras will deliver better DR and color information, but keeping all things equal, like sensor technology and the size of the photo sites, should there even be a difference? Thanks again, and until next time, bye. So this is a this is another complicated one, and it's complicated because there's so many different wafers on the market. Um, age of the sensor is going to play a big part too. But what if they're the same? He's saying all things equal. Yes, yeah. all things equal. And that does happen. I mean, there's a lot of situations where medium format sensors essentially built up from multiple full frame sensors next to each other. Or APS-C. Yes, or APS-C. So the thing I would say there, has still the thing to remember is, although you might have the exact same wafer, there's still a lot going in the background. Big thing is going to be you're going to have more megapixels because a physically larger sensor built up of more actual area, you're going to have more megapixels. And when you have more megapixels, uh, we've talked about this quite a bit, noise is is often in relation to how you're going to display it, right? The actual end result of it. If I have more megapixels, if I do smaller displays, smaller prints, each individual pixel is smaller, the noise is individually smaller, and so the appearance of it is smaller, right? So that plays a big part in it. As well, there's so much going on in the back end, like we talked about, well, like I talked about with F1 cars. You know, all these sensors are basically doing the same thing, and they're driving a track, but what everybody does tweaking the back end and small little changes and the, the processing engine and and where they they choose to you know start the base iso and how they deal with shadow noise there's so many different techniques and approaches that honestly i mean we don't even know all of them i mean there's there's a lot of engineering going into that ball there that you can get quite different results even though the actual hardware is very similar 
I, I think the biggest thing to keep in mind, again, saying all things being equal is you have more total surface area. I mean, the image quality just comes down to how much light you can soak up. The more, the better. If you have a larger surface area for that light to go onto, you are going to get more information on it, which means less noise. And when we talk about dynamic range, I mean, highlights clip when they clip. It's all how much can you bring up those shadows. If you collect more light, you can bring those shadows up with less penalty. And that is really what it's all about. As we that go, said, you know, not just full frame to medium format, No, every sensor everything. size as we step up. Yeah. That being said, you know, you did talk about medium format cameras. I mean, medium format cameras will often do 16-bit RAW. We don't find that to be that big an advantage uh, over 14-bit, which a lot of other cameras will do. Uh, and also, uh, you know, sometimes medium format cameras, the dynamic boost is there, but it's like two thirds of a stop, you know, it's not, it's not always like this huge, huge change. So I feel like full frame is really kind of the sweet spot right now for where a lot of the engineering goes, the manufacturing, um, you know, the effort. And so full frame, I think still give you a really good combination of excellent dynamic range without having to go to a larger camera. All right. Next one is an email from Matthew Bynowski. I'm a Nikon shooter looking to acquire a general purpose lens for Z-mount. I already have the 105mm macro lens and 600mm telephoto. For more, quote, normal photography than <laughs> macro or birds in flight, four choices make some sense to me. 28-75 to f2.8, 24-70 to f4, 24-120 to f4, and 24-70 to f2.8. With the exception of the latter, all of them are more or less the same cost. All possible is ducking the whole issue by continuing to use my 28 to 300 F mount on its D750, which is for him, right. $0. A quick inspection <laughs> of Nikon's published MTF curves for all of them do not show any huge differences in performance, but that's only lab data. You folks are really likely to have actual use experience with all five choices. Which would you choose and why? Yeah. And we do have experience with all these lenses. Um, and they're all good lenses. Uh, the, the, I guess, you know, it, the 24 to 70 F4 is a great kit lens. We've talked about how, how it is nice optically. I feel like if you were to buy that with a camera where you get the kit price, yeah. it makes a lot of sense. I don't know that I would invest in it on its own afterwards because you have lenses like the 24 to 120 F4, which would probably be my vote only because like that lens optically is very good. I mean, it's at the point where every shot I get with it, I'm like, I like that shot. I'm happy with it. It's got good detail. It's nice. There's no nasty surprises. Is that the one we were using in Idaho? That is the yeah. one we were using in Idaho. Yeah, that was and shockingly it takes great good photos. at everything. At shockingly everything. good. Absolutely. And so, you know, it's versatile. You're still getting an F4 aperture. I would probably personally go that way. Um the 24-70 to 70 f2.8 obviously is going to be very expensive, and that is a killer lens if you feel you need the extra light, but most people don't. Yeah, I think the 28-75 is an interesting one if you want that 2.8 aperture. That's a great portrait lens as well, um, but my preference would still be the 24-120. to Having processed Chris's shots from Idaho, I'm like, this <laughs> lens is so it's good. Really and good. I mean, I know we've we've tested the two and the 24-70 at... 70 is a little bit sharper in the corners, but having that extra 50 millimeters of reach, I think yeah. offsets that. I recommend you go watch that video if you haven't. I'm sure you've watched already. If you're listening to the podcast, you've definitely watched their video about Hobo. Go go look at the pictures because we have some on Petapixel too, like where he wrote his story about it or where I wrote his story about it. There we go. I wrote <laughs> the story and I used his pictures. Uh, you can actually see the quality of those images and they're all just really good. The food ones in particular are just like, ah. Oh, yeah, oh. and I largely I largely relied on just that twenty four to one twenty. Yeah, you, I feel like that was all you had on there. So. Yeah. Um, uh we should talk future pin it in. We should do an Idaho episode as well. Cause that came out while we were on hiatus. There's a lot to talk no, about. No, it came out while you had to take care of a sick child. You missed your opportunity. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that did it. But you guys didn't talk about Idaho well that <laughs> No, because <laughs> you weren't here to to, to bring to the right. discussion. At some, that's, at some point we should talk about Idaho. Right. That'd be fun. It would have all just me been just complaining about not getting the fish. So you wouldn't want to be there anyways. Yeah. Never enough fishing for you. Yeah. Uh, all right, we're gonna do a couple more. Uh, this one is from Joaquin Stenad. This is an email. It was a really long email, so I have just kind of compressed it. My right. wife needs a video-centric camera to document her project to refurbish an old dollhouse, make new furniture and indoor decorations for it, huh. etc. It will probably be published on YouTube as a DIY project, maybe some ASMR content with the sound of sanding wood, cutting little things, etc. What question is, what camera would you buy for this purpose? And they were already considering the Sony ZV-1. Yes. Um, so is that their, their budget? 
is between three and seven hundred dollars. So it's not very much. Uh, I was gonna say I like Panasonic Micro Four Thirds for that. Um, a used one is what they send. They could, they could sure. find it used for three to seven. Absolutely, like a GH five or GH four or something like that. Um, just because you can get some really nice lenses that give you magnification for what you're doing. Because it sounds like you'd want to have nice well, GH five would be good. Compact. Well, the GH. Really. So for a slightly higher price, the GH five makes a ton of sense because you can get it on a super cheap kit with the twelve sixty. Oh, I also think you can find it which used. Which is one of my. F- yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Which is. I, that was my product photography lens for it's the last macro. seven years, I think. Uh, it's an outstanding yeah. close-up performer. Um, but yes, the ZV-1 is a really nice option as well. And I would get the ZV-1, not the Mark II. I don't think that extra wide angle is going to be as useful for you. And you can get a little bit closer with the uh, 24 to 70 millimeter lens. I don't remember that. its macro capability. I, it was okay. It's quite good. Yeah. 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 Not as good as the 1260 on a GH5, but again, yeah. that's going to be a bit of a premium there. I, I'd guess you're looking like 1200 to get a GH with that lens used right uh, now. I, I feel like you could get it for less if you looked hard, but yeah, it's, yeah. Well, I'm not giving you mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. This is another speak pipe from Jeremy. Let's listen in. Hello, Chris, Jordan, and Jaren. This is Jeremy, and I'm struggling to feel inspired by my local area to go out and shoot. How do you get over the feeling that everything you want to photograph is somewhere else? How do I find the beautiful and the interesting in an area that isn't? What do you think about this, guys? Like, because you make Calgary look really interesting. Do we? I don't know. I mean, mean, the simple response is go to Idaho, right? Isn't that? (laughs) (laughs) Not brought to you by Visit Idaho. We've been shooting in Calgary for over a decade, and and it is absolutely hard to make it, you know, even remotely interesting sometimes. And we do visit a lot of the same locations and stuff. I mean, the the only thing I would say, Jeremy, is the the most important thing to remember in photography, I think, anyways, location is interesting, sure. and, And we're lucky that we get to travel to other locations, and that does keep us sane. But it's really light. I mean, light is everything. So regardless of where you live, what you really should be doing is, is trying to chase interesting light or finding places where the light is interesting, whether that be in interior buildings or, you know, uh, just the way light hits your downtown area and reflects off things. You know, that's what you're really supposed to be hunting for because that's where the interest is. Um, if you're not hunting for light, yeah, then you are just shooting the same locations over and over in in dull conditions and you'll get very similar results and then the only thing you could really hope for is you know shooting people for example because they tend to change from day to day uh and do different things from day to day animals yeah, wildlife, don't chase same. the same one person yeah. every time yeah, well, you go out they'll get do, uncomfortable but, at a certain you know, good point. luck in jail uh but yeah it's um it is a challenge absolutely and if you can get out and, and travel even a little bit, that can be helpful, but it depends where you live. I mean, in Canada, you could drive 10 hours and it's basically the same stuff. So, you know, I get it. I get it. We do often travel, what, down to the South Jordan, like, you know, maybe small town stuff or, or drum heller, you know, we look for different landscapes, but really it's the light, it's the light that you got to hunt for. One recommendation I would really give is um, I've had a lot of fun either putting a restriction on myself when I go out to shoot, like, hey, I'm just bringing one prime out with me, like a 35 millimeter, a wonderful focal <laughs> length. The best, really. lets you create, yeah, yeah um, good. a really vi- wide variety of things. Or like I l- have had a great experience going out to places I've, I've shot a million times. I'm so bored with, with like an ultra wide. I know I did that recently with a Laowa super wide lens or a super telephoto, a focal length I don't use a lot. Yeah. So, you know, even just rent something for a day, it's not that expensive to do. And uh, I find that can be really satisfying to just look yeah. at places you've seen all the time with a completely different perspective. You know, an- another thing you do is you can look at other photographers and see how, you know, I mean, everybody sees the world differently. And and that's a, a really big part of, of how life looks interesting. And uh, there's a person I follow on Instagram, Tammy Trashbags, and they shoot in Bristol, uh, which Tammy is not a huge bags. town. Yeah, Tammy <laughs> Trashbags, they shoot in Bristol. And the way they see the world is unbelievably beautiful. And, you know, they're looking for light, they're looking for interesting color, uh, but also just having that sort of eye of, of where you position things in the composition. And so every time I look at their photographs, I'm always blown away by, you know, it's the same town. It, it's very similar subject matter, but always enjoyable to, uh, to look at. So, yeah. Someone who... I have... Sorry, go ahead. 
I was just going to say, I have like, I grew up on a farm in Southern Alberta and I don't see the Alberta country the way that Leah does in this book that I actually love looking at where if I go to a farm in Alberta, I'll be like immediately like bummed out out of here. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Uh, So yeah, that's a perfect point, Chris. Uh, What I was going to say is I had a similar situation come up where I I, I looked at someone else's work and it inspired me to go see because I knew what they were seeing and they saw something different than me because we saw the like it was uh, during the trip in Japan. Uh, His name is Casey. His YouTube channel is GX Ace and he just does the coolest looking videos he does it from the perspective of like someone looking at this time from the future so like everything it's like, oh, cool. it's like his ideas message from the future i think and um the the way that he edits his pictures and the, the way that he sees light chris is um was very inspiring mm-hmm. uh i will i will link him in the description below because his channel is dope af and I think he is an incredible creator. And his video about the X-106 made me want to go shoot more with a camera. And I, I already to get wanted fired. to shoot. <laughs> we should get him on the pod. Uh, we, I can ask him if he'd be interested in getting on the pod. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, last one of the tech support. And then we'll bang through the, la- the three. Never read the comments. But okay. the first one is from Nicholas. It's a speak pipe. So let's listen in. Hi. With the recent phone reviews, I'm wondering how manufacturers decide what a times 0.6 or a times 5 telephoto even are. How do the zoom factors you see on smartphones relate to focal length or field of view? Thanks. It's completely arbitrary. Yep. No, I just, I, I, no, it's not actually. <laughs> no, it's not. It's, it's, it's actually fuels. very, it's, a, it's it surprisingly simple. Yeah, it's surprisingly simple. Yeah. Uh, go uh, ahead. You're basically, yeah, explain you're it. basically, <laughs> <laughs> it's simple take our word for it moving on to the next question it, it's it's just they're basically just multiplying the the focal length of the main camera right to get all the other cameras um so whatever your main camera focal length is five times that for example would then be the focal length equivalent right of your of your uh main camera five times so for your telephoto uh, and then your ultra wide they'll often do like 0.6 times right so it's just a fraction of the focal length of that main camera so that's where the the numbers aren't arbitrary, but they do it in such a way because it, it I guess it's easier to digest, you know, the the difference between a Samsung having a 10 times zoom versus an Apple iPhone having a five times zoom, right? Rather than give in photographic terms, what we tend to do is say, well, I've got a 24 mil lens and then my telephoto is a 120 millimeter lens or whatever. So I think it's really works. interesting that we use a different thing for smartphones than compact cameras, which would always be from your widest lens. Like I remember Kodak yeah. even brought out a camera with two lenses it was an ultra wide and then a three times zoom lens and they called it a five times zoom because they were basing it on the ultra wide which we don't do with smartphones because like an apple with a five times zoom you could say like it's got an ultra wide it's actually a 10 times zoom Mm. compared to that ultra (laughs) wide but they don't do that so everything's weird now yeah it's not that weird it's 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 fairly fairly straight i'm calling it weird i'm going on record with weird (laughs) But that's and, and you know what? Of course, because the sensors are so tiny on smartphones, the the true focal length numbers will often be in very strange, minuscule numbers compared to what we're used to, right? I mean, lenses will be five millimeters and seven millimeters and stuff like you know, n- not the double digits we're used to in most cameras. But the concept is the same. They'll they'll usually give a full frame equivalent, you know, twenty four millimeter wide angle, twenty five millimeter wide angle. Your telephotos will typically one hundred and twenty somewhere in that range or more, and. Um, and so that's how it relates to focal length or field of view. We, we convert everything to full frame field of view. Then we have some concept of how it's going to look compared to another camera, even though half the time you're shooting your phone vertically, not horizontally. I mean, it's, yeah, smartphones are a mess. Damn you, smartphones. Damn you straight to hell. <laughs> okay. Um, that is Can we it. make that a shirt, Jared? <laughs> damn you, smartphones. Yes. Damn you straight to hell. Uh, tech support. That's it for the week. We're going to move on to never read the comments, the section where we make sure to always read your comments. And boy, reading your comments was a lot this week because there were a lot of comments. <laughs> um, this one's actually a leftover from last week that I, we didn't get a chance to get to and I wanted to get okay. Jordan here on it. But uh, it's from T on YouTube. Hey, Jaren, Jordan, Chris, I really love your videos. Do you have any tips on how to pick photos? What I mean, I'm a hobbyist photographer and one of the biggest problems is I always end up with a bunch of images and I can't seem to choose only a couple of them, although most of them are really similar i just find something in each and convince myself i need to keep it the problem however is later when i look back at them like a couple of months later i get lost in the plethora of images help well t you could do what chris does which 
<laughs> horrified me, but he'll just pick one or two, one from the set. He'll pick one, and then I watch him delete everything else. <laughs> he holds on to nothing. Nothing. And it's no. just like, oh my god! But what if? Ah, uh, nope, gone, no. deleted. He's like, nope, don't worry about it. Delete. It's it's <laughs> it is. I don't know. I can't do it. But both him yeah. and Jordan does it with video too. As soon as he's done editing a video, he's like, delete, gone. See you later. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, I mean, we're putting through so much content. I mean, first off, just logistically, it would be a nightmare. But also, I don't know. It's kind of like I like to put things out of sight that way. Like, you know, I don't want to have to feel like, oh, I'm missing something. And if I've deleted, it's gone. Right. My wife is simply is is, is like you, Jaren. She cannot delete anything like the the the. Just and I get what if it. I need it's it? like the the anxiety of like, oh, what what am I? What did I get rid of? Right. Yeah, what if I need the a USB cable of images? Yeah. Yes. Like, I, have, yeah. I had a drawer of USB cables that I finally got rid of because they were like micro <laughs> USB to You're like. You need one in a couple months. You'll see. I'm gonna uh, need that FireWire cable. I swear. I to God. did eventually get rid of my FireWires. <laughs> Dude. But I mean, you know, I, I I like to shoot. First off, I'm quite selective now in my old age before taking a photo. There's a lot of times where I'll raise the camera and then I'll be like, oh, it's gross. It's garbage. I, it's the worst photo ever. I say this to all the time. And so I'll ignore it. So I'm quite selective about what I even take a picture of in the first place. Then often I'm shooting, I like to shoot bursts a lot. Uh, and that's more from really just trying to make sure that I have something sharp and in focus, especially if I'm pushing things to slower shutter speeds and stuff. So I tend to do bursts. And that means when I'm in the, in the sequence afterwards, I don't want to keep all of them, right? I, I'll generally start from the rear because I feel like I've probably made the best decisions towards the end of that where I say, oh, maybe I should use different aperture. Maybe I should do this. And I'll, I'll work my way back looking through the photos. But a lot of them are just going to be sequential repeats. So I'm basically looking for, is it in focus? You know, is it sharp? Great. Okay, that's the one I'll go for. No point looking at the others. Uh, you know, as long, they're not going to be any better. Um, and then, yeah, get rid of them. Get rid of them. Yeah. I, I, I feel like... If you uh, if you hold on to a lot of photos and look back at them later, there is some. I, I I don't know if you should take photos where you look at them right away and then look at them later. I feel like that's a recipe for disaster. You're just going to drive yourself crazy. But I think there is some merit into taking photos, putting them aside, and then looking at them weeks later or months later, where you're not biased by the experience that you had when you were shooting. But of course, we don't have that luxury in our business, so it's very quick shoot, look, evaluate, throw away, and don't worry about it. Yeah, why? yeah, speaking for myself, like I have gotten much more ruthless through the years. <laughs> I will, if I'm shooting like a family event or something like that, I'm like, you know, one sequence of kid on boat. Good. Done. Um, <laughs> I make that decision. Everything. Like, I, I think you have to do that because uh, yeah. even scrolling through like old photos on my phone and something like that, it just, it, it gets tedious and it keeps you from actually seeing the best image if you have a bunch of different options. So yeah. I want to make that decision in the moment, save myself future stress. So I know, Hey, this picture of kid on boat is the best of the pictures of kid yeah. on boat. And I'm looking at it right <laughs> now and it's great. Do, do you, you know how I cheat? I choose a lot of these photos, though. I think it's important to say because, you know, I think the question also is how do you pick which ones you like from all the photos that you've taken? And uh, sharpness, and I, obviously, that's the only metric by which photography yeah, should be. Yeah, see, and judged, I, I hate Chris. that. Uh, <laughs> I hate that. That's how it used to be, and I, I don't want to do that anymore. So um, I, I honestly go by feel. I go by like, do I do I get a response to something hold me and grab me? That's my main indicator for then. Okay, I should I should look at this photo more. And if I'm comparing similar photos, I really just go by which one speaks to me a little bit more than the other one does, even if they're very similar. All right. Um, I I just keep everything because I'm a maniac and I have apparently endless storage. I tell myself that I <laughs> keep it later and I, I haven't run out of storage yet. Uh, all right. Last, uh, last ones are two for Jordan. We're going to end it on this. Uh, Alfonso Herrera Mora asked I w or said, I wish Jordan would shoot more with the XH2S. That camera looks gorgeous. And a, John Shockey responded in response to that. I'm wondering what lens he used. So Jordan, please yep. talk about why you apparently hate the X-H2S and don't want to use I it. I love the X-H2S. <laughs> and then what lens were you using? <laughs> so first of all, I mean, it really, it's the X-H2S has a great sensor, but it comes back to Eterna is my favorite, like 709, like a profile where you can just shoot it, 
slap it online and it's going to look pretty good. Uh, I just find it has wonderful colors, really nice contrast. I don't have to do much work to it at all. Um, so that is absolutely, if I'm just going to shoot and share, that's my favorite profile currently available. Uh, like Panasonic's like 709 is my favorite on their bodies, but uh, I do find it has a little more of a video look than the Eterna. Uh, F-Log 2 as well, their new F-Log profile is gorgeous and grades incredibly well. So for that episode, just depending on the contrast, all things being equal, I prefer to shoot an Eterna. Less work for me if it's all going to fit in the uh, waveform because Fujifilm is now putting waveforms in their cameras. Um, but if there's a lot of contrast, switch over to F-Log. And I love that Fujifilm has a lot which is generally they'll give you like log to 709, a standard color space. Fujifilm makes an actual log to Eterna profile. Mm. Uh, so if you want a similar contrast curve, but want to make sure that you hang on to a little more DR, that's a great way to work as well. So yes, I love those cameras. I've said repeatedly, they're some of my favorites for shooting videos. The limitation is glass. They don't make a lot of uh, video centric lenses with the exception of they have MK series manual focus lenses. Uh, that's what I reviewed the X-H2S on initially. Uh, they're spectacular, but I don't have $5,000 per focal length kicking around to use those <laughs> all the time. But stunning lenses. Uh, the one that I used to shoot that, uh, the camera store had a uh, 16 to 55 available, uh, which is just a great f2.8 standard zoom. Uh, a little bit limited, though, in terms of it does breathe quite a bit. Yeah. Um, it does have a focus clutch, but the focus clutch is backwards from what a regular video lens would be. So it always slows me down a little teensy bit. So, uh, so I want. So yeah, the, sorry, go ahead. You, you, so I wish Jordan would shoot more with the X-H2S. And the reason you don't is lenses. That's a big part of it. Yeah. I, I look at the glass that I want to shoot on before I pick a camera body, mm -hmm. uh, like a recent trip that we took. You know, I, I knew I wanted that 28 to two travel zoom, you know, before I chose a body for it. Uh, so that yeah. is a big priority for me. If I get a set of MK cinema uh, <laughs> video lenses, then yeah, man, I'm grabbing an X-H2S all you the time. Carry it's those a great around? video body. Come on. Would you want to carry those around? Yeah, but they're, they're great. I'll suck it up. <laughs> no, you won't. Maybe one. Your, I'll do the your bag is already <laughs> so heavy, dude. Like, I mean, I, Panasonic I like do a bag. great job of making lenses that work well for video. And I yeah. think that has to be Especially for the style of shooting we do. Yeah. Absolutely. That has to be appreciated. Yeah. But yes, I love the image from the Fuji films. I'm always thrilled when I get them into editing and start playing with them. I just find those files look great. All right. Cool. That's it. That's the podcast. That's it. Yep. That's just nice. That's all I got. It was nice to oh. be back. Oh, I bet Jaren's so happy right I'm now. So just happy. holding that perfect. I, I look, oh, look look at it. It. It's just so good. It's, 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 it's just it's creativity good. in a small little box. Yeah. It's unbelievable. It's a camera. Light goes in it. And six one hundred six for anyone just listening. I'm just now holding it up. I'm looking through the viewfinder. Anyway, <laughs> just furiously trolling Chris. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone for tuning in this week. Thanks to our podcast sponsor OM System again for sponsoring the episode. It was uh, great to see all three of us here again. Finally, it's. It's been a while, been a few weeks. Uh, we're back on schedule though, and we'll see you all next week where we'll have a guest. Who it is, what? you'll find out next time. Tune in next week. See you then. Bye. Bye.